Hi there, I'm Kari Norgard, and I'm not sure if I uh, should feel uh, rude or it's unfair that you all are going to listen to me and I don't get to be there listening to you, but I um, certainly hope my comments are useful for the collective conversation. And I'd like to especially thank the organizers and especially David Schlossberg for um, putting on this truly incredible uh, looking conference. And I want to start by acknowledging that um, Sydney, where you all are gathered, um, is land of the Eora Nation, and that I myself am living and working in Kalapuya, unceded Kalapuya territory. I recently was privileged to be able to listen to a conference that Kyle Powis White put together um, on live stream, and um, Audra Mitchell, Canadian settler uh, theorist, talked about how her life and work were made possible through histories of violence. And I really appreciated that and want to add to that. Um, that is true of myself as well, um, the histories of violence in this place that have made it possible. And as well, the histories of violence of my own people, um, my family come from Norway, uh, Denmark and Finland under conditions um, that they, the conditions under which they left uh, were not good. Finally, um, the most of this you're going to not see me, you'll just see the, uh, the slides, um, but I want to start by saying, you know, everything that I'm going to talk about, I've learned um, from spending about a decade and a half working with folks in the Kaduk tribe, and I've learned a lot as well from other native uh, indigenous uh, scholars and researchers, uh, some of whom are there with you, Kyle White in particular, uh, who is chairing this panel and my colleagues here at University of Oregon and elsewhere. So, thank you. So I've titled my talk, Decolonizing Environmental Justice, Lessons from the Klamath River. I want to acknowledge that the term decolonizing um, can get thrown around a little too loosely. And what I mean by it here is to highlight and bring attention to the ways that I think the environmental justice movement has failed to uh, integrate and acknowledge um, indigenous movements and lessons and also to point to some ways forward for this. So I have been working with and learning from people in the Karuk tribe since about 2003-2004 and what I'll speak about is things I've been learning from um, a whole number of individuals including especially the four people on the screen and um, in the middle bottom is Ron Reed, who is the Kaduk tribe's cultural biologist, a traditional dipnet fi fisherman, and my main collaborator for the last 15 years. Um, on the right is Leif Hillman, who is the tribe's, uh, the founder of the Kaduk tribe's Department of Natural Resources and currently its director. In the top middle is uh, Dr. Frank Lake, who's a Kaduk descendant and has works for the Forest Service and has done a great deal of important work on the recognition of traditional ecological knowledge. On the left is Bill Tripp, who is also a kind of traditional fisherman, and he's the lead, he's deputy director for the tribe's ecocultural revitalization program and has also been very active in the lead on a lot of the fire restoration work that they're doing now. Uh, Bill and I in particular have been working together more recently in, in projects on climate change. Kaduk Aboriginal Territory is about 1.48 million acres. It is mostly in Northern California. I apologize that that map is a little small there. And it does extend um, up into Oregon. It's the area, the Cloud River runs through the area and the, their land um, occupancy and title are not recognized by the state of California or the federal government. They have no reservation. And this means that most of the areas in which people live and seek to manage um, are officially under the management of the U.S. Forest Service. So the Kaduk tribe faces quite a few environmental justice issues. Um, amongst them, the one that I've worked most on and began working on has to do with four main stem dams, which are now slated to come out. These dams uh, block fish passage for most of the spring salmon run, which is the most important food source and they're hopefully will be coming out in January 2020. Uh, it's an amazing pro uh, progress and hard, hard work of many, many people. The work that Ron and I first started doing was what became known as the altered diet study. We emphasized the relationship between the lack of salmon due to the dams 
and the um, instances of food security, these are commodity foods that many people eat, and the, of course, the instance of high rates of diet-related diseases. So the Kadup tribe became the first tribe to claim that a dam was giving them artificially high rates of di uh, diabetes, and that was um, very interesting to work with and very much the vision of my colleague Ron Reed. Also, the dams cause um, warm water conditions that produce a highly toxic algae. It's a liver toxin, it's a neurotoxin, and it's quite dangerous. These photos are not uh, are doctored. The colors are unreal. And um, not related to the river specifically, although it's all connected, in the face of 150 years of fire exclusion, uh, people burn traditionally, and that has not been legal for a very long time. And now between fire exclusion and the rising, uh, the changing patterns of precipitation and temperature from climate change, there's been an increased frequency of very high severity fires. And this is quite a big deal. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, while environmental indigenous peoples have been part of what we th have thought of as environmental justice, um, the fact that indigenous peoples have been resisting colonialism and doing this kind of work isn't often how the story is told. It's often told more um, as an outgrowth of the civil rights movement, and the, the movement has often had more of that kind of discourse and framing. And so it's taken um, a long time, um, and I would say it has yet to occur, that indigenous values, worldviews, and goals have been reflected in the broader conceptions of environmental justice. Instead, there's been a focus on race and racism as dominant movement frames. Uh, this is important. Race and racism matter, and they are very important, but I would say it's um, insufficient and it's useful for uh, these communities as well as um, non um, uh, just settler communities that are not communities of color, white, white communities, to understand indigenous perspectives. So rather than language about equality or rights to clean water and air, Kind of people that I work with talk about um, caretaking visions that are responsibilities to their relations in the natural world. Um, these responsibilities get disrupted uh, by the natural resource policies of a settler colonial state. So nature is not so much a platform for action upon which rights are unequally distributed, but it is a treasured relative. And again, there's a sense of relationality kin centricity, responsibility, and the natural world is alive and animate. Again, not just sort of a platform for action. So why might this apply to other communities? Um, while discourses of rights uh, are important, I certainly don't think anyone should argue that they don't matter. Um, discourses of responsibility, in addition, I think can be uh, quite powerful. My colleague here at University of Oregon, Dr. Laura Pulido, has been talking, for example, about some of the, um, the limits um, in, um, in current environmental justice framing. And here, this is not so much pertaining to rights discourse per se, um, but the idea of the role of the state. And so she, I'll just read the second part of the quote, if she says that um, you know, environmental justice movements have not been wholly successful, and if, in fact, environmental racism is constituent of racial, racial capitalism, this suggests that activists and researchers should view the state as a site of contestation rather than as an ally or more neutral force. David Pello, who is with you, has also talked about this. If we think of um, some of the mainstream environmental movements where the state is not even visible or being sought after as an ally in many cases, um, but there's sort of a a very neoliberal um, individualization of responsibility uh, to action, I think indigenous perspectives are extremely important. It can be difficult. I want to note this is not coincidental. If, if a lot of environmentalism has looked the way it does, um, it's not coincidental that it's difficult to sort of know what to do. And here, one of my favorite sociologists is C.W. Mills, who in 1959 talked about the importance of having a sociological imagination, which is really the ability to see power. And this is what Mills, I mean, excuse me, this is what Polito is mentioning as well, the ability uh, to understand that the state is not your ally and to be able to see actually what should be done. Turns out 
my uh, kind of collaborators and a few other indigenous people I know are pretty good at seeing uh, relationships between events across time um, and between state actions and impacts. We can think about seeing relationships, why things are happening, who's responsible, what needs to be done. And when it comes to why things are happening, um, seeing connections between events, seeing patterns over time, and again, seeing the causal role of the state in these. And again, I'm suggesting these are all forms of sociological imagination that indigenous people that I've hung out with are pretty darn good at. Um, and most importantly, this per pertains to acting on relationships. What is it that can be done, should be done, needs to be done? And the sense that one has responsibility to their relations in the human community, indigenous communities and settler communities that overlap there as well and in the natural world. So kind of people have a concept of Pikiavish in particular, they're known as the world renewal people, which comes from the Pikiavish ceremonies. But today, Pikiavish actually is talked about as manifesting in a wide range of actions and tactics for, uh, for, for survival, for renewal. Um, and these include uh, ceremonies, but they also include um, doing actions on the land, such as river restoration, fire restoration, holding meetings, um, speaking publicly, all of these kinds of things. Kaduk tribe has been very involved in legal actions against the state. They have just um, filed a petition uh, for spring chinook salmon to be listed as an endangered species and are frequently involved with lawsuits with the uh, um, Forest Service and other entities. They're been quite, they use direct action um, in many cases and frequently in relation to fire policy, in relation uh, to the dams and other issues. And they are leaders when it comes to um, proactive looking forward and thinking about how can we get where it needs to happen. So they, um, my colleague in particular, the reason I'm working with them is because Ron Reed reached out um, so persistently and eloquently and sort of trained me up. Um, and he's done this with another, a number of other academics, including a set of researchers at UC Berkeley and people at other institutions, Humboldt and Davis. With the a kind of people are very actively collaborating with um, within their community, um, within the Kudu community, and also within the non-native community that lives in the same within their territory, with other tribes, and even with the U.S. Forest Service. There's a major uh, collaboration happening now around fire. So bringing full circle of what this might mean in terms of the nature of power that might be useful for. Uh, larger environmental movements, and um, especially I want to sort of add in the moment in time that we are in in the United States, in the Trump administration, when there is a lot of feeling of powerlessness. Now, indigenous conceptions of power um, also draw on relationships with the land. This is not uh, Hannah Arendt, <laughs> who I'll, I'll refer to here, uh, doesn't go that far. Um, but. She does talk about power is not a property of an individuals, but of a plural, plurality of actors joining together for common political purpose. Unlike force, it is not a natural phenomenon, but a human creation, the outcome of collective engagement. Power springs up when people get together and act in concert, but it derives its legitimacy from the initial getting together rather than any action that may follow. And this, I would say, is one thing I've learned incredibly uh, from my uh, Karuk uh, colleagues and friends and collaborators has to do um, with this sense of power coming um, from acting together and from community. So I want to close with um, a passage um, from my friend Ron Reed. We are trying to get back to an intact world. Climate change can be a vehicle for that because of the awareness it brings to so many about limitations in the current management practice. We believe there is genuine interest in cut of perspectives about how to care for the land we offer these explanations in the hope that this is true. I want to close by saying Yotva, thank you to all who've shared information, insights, and stories. Yotva for listening. May the rivers, people, and forests of the Klamath and all of your places in this world flourish.